So, vignette number one. 1982, a bedroom, Brighton, which for the purposes of you that may not know, is a town on the south coast of England that attracts a large, at this point, lesbian and gay, rather than queer, population. I have moved to Brighton to do an MA at Sussex University. Following a series of intense identity politics interviews, to which I am subjected and to which I subject others, I find myself living in a house with two lesbians. I arrive with all the accoutrements of the art student feminist look that I had sported for four years doing feminist art history in Leeds. This is where Elizabeth was mentioning earlier in Yorkshire where you had to pull the bits of moss out of your clothing. <laughs> Colored leggings, bright socks, vintage dresses, badges, bangles, and beads. In Brighton, the look is black denim, buzz cut short hair, and Doc Martin boots for everyone, not just the dykes. I am the most colorful thing in the library. Strangers stop me to ask me about my clothes. I'm not joking. <laughs> Having spent my undergraduate years desperate to, let gay, to get laid by a woman, but somewhat hindered, I'm getting very loud again, aren't I? Somewhat hindered by the existence of my out-of-town boyfriend. Remember, this was Leeds, home to revolutionary radical, les le revolutionary radical lesbian separatist feminism, and very definitely pre-queer. I discover in Brighton that despite the rigors of the dress code, the sexual politics are less doctrinaire, and that there are women who will take me on while I make the transition. Within months, I have finally, finally arrived in lesbian heaven. But there is a cost. The lesbian style mafia has cut my hair, cut my nails, put me in black denim, and persuaded me to get my ear pierced for the prerequisite labrous earring. Vignette number two, five years later, summer 1988, still Brighton. I am standing in the communal changing room of High Street Store Wallace, a British brand, trying on a navy blue lace linen pencil skirt, knee length lined with a short slit at the back. My relatively straight woman friend, Rachel, we lesbians, and she are convinced she is on the turn, but it turns out she wasn't, or maybe, I don't know, I haven't seen her for some time. Well, <laughs> Rachel is sitting on the floor in her Doc Martens black jeans and leather jacket, no makeup, while we debate the ideological significance of me buying this dubious pencil skirt. Eventually, we decide that, worn with Doc Martens and a loose protest t-shirt, probably in this moment with an anti-Section 28. Section 28 was the Thatcher government's um, policy that forbade municipal providers of education and welfare of promoting the equality of gay relationships. So probably with an anti-Section 28 slogan on it, well, we decide the skirt could be okay, that I won't look too recuperably het. I have just that summer started to wear a bra again after years of feminist bralessness. It is, needless to say, a sports bra. In other words, I've got that mono boob look going on. I am wearing bright red lipstick, no other makeup, and my eyebrows are as unplucked as my legs are virgin. This is makeup as political pronouncement. Vignette number three. Summer 1995. Lesbian and gay pride, not yet bisexual, not yet trans, certainly not yet commercially sponsored, in Victoria Park, Hackney, East London. In the women's tent are a group of young women, about 16 or 17 years old, long hair, made up. They are all wild with excitement, dancing with each other, careering about, charmingly full of fun at the excitement of the occasion. They are all, all wearing baby doll dresses, a much vaunted, if not widely taken up, fashion story that summer. Apart from the fact that I don't have the thighs for that most unforgiving of dresses, no, really, I am somewhat horrified at the revitalization of this problematically infantilizing garment. And these girls, do they understand themselves as lesbian? Are they at the great party in their skimpy frocks playing at deviance? They're certainly having a good look about, but then so is everybody. I want to know and I wish that I'd gone to ask them, have they dressed up specifically for pride? Would they wear these clothes at a straight club? 
Does location matter to them, or can they look like fashionable teenagers wherever they go? If these young women in a categorically lesbian space are indecipherable to me, let me take you to another vignette where the ostensibly indeterminate sexuality of another set of young women in a queer-coded space seems all too apparent. Vignette number four. Winter 2002, Manto, a gay bar in Old Compton Street, Soho, London. Sitting with my girlfriend and two male gay friends, I noticed two women smooching each other on the dance floor. They wear this season's bootcut jeans, heels, and sexy, tight, strappy tops, long hair tonged into shiny straight curtains that graze their shoulders. Whilst my top is also strappy, my hair is in a severe bob, and my makeup more emphatically implied, applied than their expensively understated lip gloss and all over tan. These women dance close, teasing each other against the beat of the music. They almost kiss, but not quite. I also notice that their glances keep returning to a table on the side of the floor, at which sit two men, clearly heterosexual, clearly their boyfriends. This is not two lesbians dancing in a gay bar. This is two heterosexual women performing for the pleasure of their men. It pisses me off. <laughs> Vignette number five. On the pavement outside a gay bar on Old Compton Street, July 2013. I find myself stopped at the entrance to an erstwhile favorite bar. Asked by a presumably subcontracted bouncer if I quote, know what sort of a bar this is. Adopting my best dowager lady duchess demeanor. We've all seen down Downton Abbey by now, honey. I instruct him imperiously to open the door for me without delay, using age, ethnicity, and class to trump his burly masculine gatekeeping. Whilst the metropolitan straight couples or heterosexual girls out with fag friends can gain cool cultural capital without having to risk diluting the privilege of their heterosexual identity, Unaccompanied femmes like me find ourselves turned away at the door if we arrive alone or with other femmes, but not if we arrive with masculine-coded women or gay men. Some validating form of masculinity is required, whatever the gender of the body that provides it. Yet, I also hear of butch women finding themselves shunned in queer bar spaces, where once the lesbian or gay bar was a haven from misrecognition, Masculine women are hassled in the women's toilets by heterosexual women, not really so cool about same-sex desire as their presence in our bars might suggest.